Welcome to 20 Minute Tabletop, a podcast about board card and miniature games. Tonight I'll be talking about a genre that I really enjoy, and that is social deduction games. And I hope today to talk to you about a few that have really caught my attention. I remember about Christmas time in the UK, there was a really, really popular reality TV show called The Traitors. And at work, everybody was talking about The Traitors and saying, this is amazing. The tension and excitement around this round table at the end of the game is just it's captivating. And at the time, I always felt like saying, you do know, don't you, that there are board games just like that board and card games that really replicate those high moments of tension and people looked at me as if I was mad and I was thinking did you never play mafia as a kid see I remember my first experience playing social deduction games was at university where some bloke had ripped out pieces of paper I think it was out of a Rizzler packet you know papers for cigarettes or whatnot and he'd put little crosses on them and it was such an arbitrary game of lying and deception and little did I know that, a few years later, I would discover that there were far more complex and elegant versions of social deduction games being innovated on year after year. Before I start though, I want to talk a little bit about what I think makes a social deduction game a social deduction game. And the best way I can explain it is it's a game where players have interactions with each other, often to deduce hidden information, find out hidden roles, or to achieve a personal objective that they've been set. And the games all typically involve either bluffing or deception, and also a little bit of deduction. And what you need to work out is who's being legitimate around the table and who isn't. And as a result, people are having secret alliances, sharing ambiguous information, and it creates a dynamic and engaging atmosphere for players. Or alternatively to that, as my mum would describe it, creating a horrific situation where she doesn't trust her family members anymore. I suppose the best thing to do though is I've recorded recently a little snippet and you'll have to excuse the sound quality of me playing One Night Ultimate Werewolf with my local gaming group. I think it really captures the essence of what a social deduction game sounds like. So I'll just play a little snippet. It's very short and like I say, do just stick with the sound quality on it. And then after that, you're going to be hearing a short conversation between myself and one of my local gaming group called Matt about some of the social deduction games that we've played together. But first though, here's the snippet of One Night Ultimate Werewolf. So in that case, my odds would be on Matt because I can believe that the two werewolves were in yeah, there. Yeah, because Matt would be saying I was the werewolf if he knew it was because he's now not the werewolf because he's yeah. the troublemaker. That's so true. he would have no, no reason to lie about well, it. I want to catch a very, werewolf. That's very true. Yeah. That well, is because very he would true. want everyone to vote. Yeah, so yeah. I must be a villager, so it's either Tom or Matt. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree. Totally with your logic, apart from the fact I know it's not me. So, <laughs> it, it, I don't know why, I just I'm, think he's tough. I've got a kick track of this. <laughs> yeah, no, I honestly. Like I don't believe what Tom says. <laughs> <laughs> but it is Matt in this case. I mean, and what's funny about this. It could be no one. Is he doesn't even know who he is. <laughs> he didn't last I'm either. voting for Tom. Because he's I'm, not protesting I'm, at all, mate. You honestly, it's a mistake. It, honestly. <laughs> honestly. I, honestly, I it's a mistake. I honestly. can't wrap my head around. There's cards swapping at that. I think we've wasted that one. It's definitely not us. If if it's Tom, it's not. Then I'm unsubscribing from his podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you subscribe. Time is up, everyone. Okay, so you've just heard the snippet of Matt and I playing One Night Ultimate Werewolf and it might have sounded like we were having a lot of fun when you were listening to it, but I've got Matt here, and it's fair to say that you're not the biggest fan of social deduction games. You're absolutely right, Tom. Thank you for inviting me, by the way. Long-time listener, first-time caller. What is it, then, that you don't like about them? Because you know that I'm a big fan of that particular genre. You, I think, thrive in a dynamic verbal environment, as you can tell by the fact you're producing a podcast and thinking on your feet in front of a group, in front of people and leading them on. Whereas personally, I can't think of anything I enjoy less. Yeah, and we have made you play a few and it did sound like you were having a good time there. I mean, would you go as far as to say that it's something that you would actively avoid as a, as a gaming genre? Or is there some part of you that enjoys those kind of interactions? 
I enjoy the laughter and seeing it all go wrong for people. I really struggle to engage enthusiastically with the roles and things in a in a kind of free form game like One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Yeah, and on that One Night Ultimate Werewolf, it, like I say, it did sound like we're having a really good time, but I don't think it's a game that any of us particularly like. Agreed, agreed. I I didn't take much away from it, but I, I did enjoy it because we had such a uh, a blast and we knew what was going on yeah it's it's a very strange game if you are unfamiliar with it it's a game where you're almost set five minutes to solve a riddle each player is given a different character role there's a whole introduction sequence you heard a little bit in the snippet actually where there's a voiceover using the app and during that you will start off with a card you'll look at it you might be a werewolf you might be a mason you might be a simple villager that does nothing and then by the end of a talking bit at the start all the cards will have been shuffled and you've got five minutes to work out what's going so it's a it's an odd game really i think but not not my favorite in terms of social deduction games there's suddenly a lot of pressure immediately because you realize what role you've been given you may or may not have suddenly changed roles without your knowledge and you may be playing with somebody else around and you have to produce an argument to explain why you are not the werewolf if you are the werewolf. And suddenly people are challenging you about that. Yeah, and I would say about games like that, I think it's a game that I am glad to have played. You know, as an experience game, it's a bit like going to the cinema and watching a film for the first time, but I'm not sure if it's a game that I would want to bring to the table week after week. Once you've experienced it, I think, then you've experienced it. Whereas I do think some social deduction games I would play over and over again. I absolutely agree. Regarding One Night Ultimate Werewolf, I, I did spend a very long evening a number of years ago on a stag do with a group of people, some of whom were very keen on the game. And they were very, very good at it. I felt that probably made me more averse to getting involved in it in the future. But you do like some games, don't you, with elements of social deduction built in you've got dead of winter dead of winter that's the one and that's yeah. got social deduction in it built in as a game would you agree or that that's right there is a hidden traitor mechanic that the, one of the players may or may not be playing as a traitor and none of the players actually around the table other than the traitor know if there is a traitor playing depending upon how large a group you're playing with so would you say then games like that which have got it built into a more traditional board game you're quite happy for it to be part of a mechanic rather than the whole mechanic of a game. Absolutely. I, I really enjoy knowing that there might be somebody who is playing a very different game and they have a secret objective that they are trying to fulfil without giving away the fact that they are not helping the team. Yeah, a bit like Shadows Over Camelot, the yes. Days of Wonder game, which is worth... Well, it's worth quite a lot of money these days, isn't <laughs> it? It is. I'm glad you saw that. really enjoyed our time with that. Yeah. Again, though, it was a game for me that you could play a few times and then it was an experience. It was done. And there are other games that are very similar, aren't there, in, in that regard. I noticed you brought with me when I said, come around and talk about social deduction games. You brought a little box. It's an Oink Games game called Fake Artist Comes to New York. Fake Artist Goes to New York. That's goes right. to. Doesn't come to. He goes to New York. And he's on his way. Tell me a little bit about that game. So fake artist, everybody involved takes the role of an artist. And maybe you've got four plus players. I probably wouldn't play it with fewer than four players, but I'd, I'd hope to have six or more around the table. And all of the players, apart from one person, given a location or an object or a person, something that they need to draw. And one of the players is secretly not given that information. Each of the players then takes turns, everybody gets two goes, passing around a pad of paper to draw a line in their specific colour that conveys to the people around the table that they know what they're drawing. But the, the person who doesn't have that information has to have a stab at what it is that everyone else is trying to draw and put something on the paper that convinces them that they know what they're doing. And at the end of the round, Everybody votes on who they think the fake artist is. And presumably you get something like the Eiffel Tower and the fake artist is, you know, if they start drawing a circular line at some point, then 
people might be thinking they haven't got a clue. I think I've played that game. It's a lot about drawing confidently, isn't it? <laughs> you, you have to sell it. The, the key thing about Fake Artist Goes to New York as well is that the people who know what the picture is cannot draw it too precisely because if the fake artist guesses what it is, then they win the round. And it's interesting for me because that game is so, so close, isn't it, to one of my firm favourites, which is Spyfall, which is a game where, again, most people around the table know where they are. One person is a spy who doesn't know where they are, but they are trying to deduce from the verbal clues that people give them which location they're in. So, you know, in, in Spyfall, I might ask you a question, Matt, if I knew that I was in a space station, I might say, you know, do people come here often? And you would answer something like, yeah, all all the time, all the time. Yeah, and I would think, yeah, you've you're the person. So, what I think the difference between those two games is is that one of them is played in silence, isn't it? Essentially, maybe with the odd bit of laughter, and the other one is about verbal dexterity again. So, is is it the verbal dexterity nature of social deduction games that put you off? I think it's the direct lying aspect and having to make it up on the spot. I think Spyfall, we've had some really good fun with that. If you are the first player and you are the spy, then it's really hard to get the game going in a way that people don't immediately know it's obvious. Yeah, and it can be a little fruity. I mean, I have played games of Resistance Avalon where people have actually got a little bit upset. If you combine these games with alcohol and the wrong people then it can go quite quite badly, can't it? Wouldn't Have you ever experienced anything going wrong like that? Or No, I don't think I've seen it go wrong in a way that people didn't all have a good time. I think people may have been frustrated, especially with a game like Avalon, which lasts a bit longer. The one thing that I do like about Avalon, if you are one of the bad guys, the way in which you influence the game isn't necessarily overtly lying to everyone's face around the table but you do get to manipulate the results of the challenge that you're doing the task you're performing yeah and i think this is the thing about social deduction games they are quite machiavellian there is a certain pleasure a psychology because in a game you normally win the game don't you by being more efficient if you're playing a euro game whereas in these games if you're going to win a game it essentially is down to the fact that you are better at manipulating other humans which isn't which isn't a great attribute i suppose is it <laughs> absolutely right and with one night ultimate werewolf it comes 100 percent down to that with the other games that we've talked about there is a level of the mechanics and or the theme that you are playing with as well one of the things that i think playing a long time ago original werewolf it can become a very long game with a large group of people and people end up getting left out and that could be very frustrating. Yeah, play of elimination in some of those games. Even with Shadows Over Camelot, there was that bit where the traitor is found out and then is essentially just playing as the game to make it harder, but their gameplay is essentially ended at that point, which isn't that much fun. They, they lose their agency, don't they? So before we finish this chat, there is a social deduction game that you've played that I've not played that I've always wanted to try. And to be honest, it seems quite surprising given what you've said about how you feel about social deduction games that you put yourself in this situation. And that game is Two Rooms and a Boom. Will you just briefly explain what is Two Rooms and a Boom for those people that might not have heard of it? Okay, so it's a game for 6 to 30 players. And it's probably best 12 plus people. Too few and it becomes um, a bit too easy. You've got two teams, you've got the blue team and the red team, and each team has a president. Each team will win if their president is not in the same room as the bomber at the end of the game. Each person has their own role. On each team, somebody will be the bomb, and somebody will be the president, and they need to secretly manipulate the different players within their room to gain control of that room so they can vote people in and out of that room. And after a number of rounds, the game ends. And if the bomber is in the room with the president, then the bomber wins. And what was that like? Is that a game that you enjoyed when you played it? And what, where, where did you play it? How did you end up playing Two Rooms and a Boom Map without <laughs> me? Is what I want to know. Uh, this comes back to the stag do that I mentioned earlier. And I had a fantastic time. And this was one of the games we played a number of times. The first time it was uh, slightly awkward. But as we played it and understood the roles better, 
there was a level of meta a meta game was it a meta game that you got into over a few rounds i don't know if it was a, a meta game uh, necessarily but the, the more we played it the more familiar we've got with the various tactics that you can employ so you know what's on your card and only you know however you get have the opportunity to show your card to other people in the room or not if you don't want to certain characters can show their card to other people but it might they can only show half of the card and that half of the card may be truthful or not. You know what characters are in play in the game, but you don't know who is playing as what. And is it the fact that there were so many people playing that that took the pressure off you socially, do you think? Because I, I do understand that if you're playing a five-player social deduction game, that's quite intensive. You're being grilled the whole time. But if you're playing with, I don't know, 30 people, it's probably more possible to be anonymous. Yeah, yeah, that was part of it. You you would perhaps stand in the corner of the room, someone would walk up to you, and they'd say, do you, want, do you want to see my card? And you'd say, I don't know, do I want to see your card? And then you'd work out a, a way of agreeing that you'd show each other your card, or not, depending upon what your character was, but you needed to build up confidence whether or not they were on your team. And it tended to rely on somebody starting in the room saying, I am this colour, I am this card, and building from there. But But, you know... Why is was that better than Resistance Avalon for you or Spyfall or, oh. or not? You know, is it a better game for you? That's what I want to know. It... I, I don't think I enjoyed it more than Spyfall or Resistance Avalon. Those games were closer. They were very mechanic driven as opposed to personally driven. But there were certain people who played the game who would just stand in the corner and not show anything to anybody, not talk to anybody. And only when it came to a vote in the room to decide who to kick out and who would be the leader of the room, did they decide to get involved. Right, well, that's two rooms of the boom. It's a game that I can't believe you've played and I've not. I'd like to thank you for coming on, Matt. I'm going to round up now in a minute. So you're back to just me now. And what I wanted to add before I did finish is I really do, and I know Matt is a little bit more lukewarm about social deduction games, but I absolutely do adore them. I think becoming the board game mechanic yourself is quite a wonderful experience. The game is won or lost based on your ability as a player. It doesn't rely on any luck to a, a degree. You have to play the room. I also think that humans are inherently social beings and these games provide a structured environment for social interaction. A lot of games that I do play are really wonderful games, but it's fair to say that eyes are down they're looking at a table, they're moving components around, and there's definitely a place for those kind of games in my collection. And I really do adore them. I think they're great, but having games where you're focused heavily on the other human beings around the table with you is a real joy. The thing is, in terms of social interaction, is that lying and deception is socially a taboo. You're not supposed to do it, and therefore playing the game where that is part of the game really adds a bit of flavour to it and makes it more stimulating than normal social interactions would be. There's the thrill of convincing everybody of a falsehood and there's the thrill of uncovering somebody else's lies. And these games tap into our desire for social connections and interactions and it just hits all the pleasure senses for me. Another thing I think that people really like about them, and me personally, is that they give you a sense of power and control. What happens in social deduction games is that players get power because they're controlling the flow of information, they're manipulating other people's beliefs, and it is a Machiavellian thrill. And I know that probably says a lot of things about me, but successfully deceiving opponents can provide a real sense of accomplishment and mastery. And I suppose winning the game makes you feel good, but being more capable of controlling other human beings possibly feels better i don't know does it feel better than winning a traditional euro ah maybe i don't know it's another level of gaming and i know that's a dark place to go but that's what you're getting out of social deduction games i'm really aware that for some people they can be brilliant experiences and with other people, you really have to be aware of that before you even think about bringing one to the table. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the podcast tonight. That's quite enough from me. If you're wondering where Kev is at the minute, he's currently 
summing it up in Lake Garda. He's on holiday at the minute. You can expect to hear from him in the next episode if you're missing his northern tones. Once again, though, we are really thankful for the fact you turn up each week to listen. And hopefully you've enjoyed the podcast today. And if not, it's only been 20 minutes of your life. And Kev might do a better job next week. Anyway, thanks for listening. <laughs>